everybody, it's Becky. I am so excited to be making this video. I'm really hyper right now because it's about Disney World. I made a whole bunch of videos last year about Disney and I did actually some videos for the Moms with Mouse Ears channel where I talked about ways to make Disney educational in case you want to do that as well uh, without, without losing any of the fun. So I will link those videos below as well. But I'm really excited because I love Disney World and I've gone every year since I was nine. Some years we've gone twice, which to some people might seem like a lot and some people might that might not seem like a lot at all because they go more than that. But I've been lucky and blessed enough to go a lot of times in my life and my girls have been blessed enough to be able to go um, usually every year once they turn two. We've been to Disney in all different stages of life. We've gone with just one child, we've gone with two children, and of course the girls are six years apart so it's been interesting to have that age gap to kind of see how the trips changed um, and then over the years just going you know every year as the parks have changed and so a couple a week or so ago I did a call for questions about Disney World and I know that I have a Q&A video that I have not answered the questions for um, just on a, on a non Disney level I did a, a call for questions a couple months ago and I have every intention of still making that video so I'm sorry that I haven't answered those questions yet, but I will. But I wanted to do the Disney one first because I know a couple people mentioned they were planning a trip uh, pretty soon here and they wanted to kind of get my input on their questions before they plan their trip or while they're planning their trip. And so I wanted to go ahead and make this one now and I will do the, Q the Q&A questions from before. I will um, do that here coming up in the next couple weeks. But I have a whole list of questions here. I am by no means a Disney professional. I am not a travel agent. I don't know everything there is to know about Disney, but I have been a lot and um, a lot of the questions people ask me were just based on my personal opinion. So I am very opinionated and I have lots of opinions. So I'll be glad to share them with you. So I've got the list of questions here um, and I'm going to try to answer them as quickly as I can, but we all know I talk a lot. So I'll try to keep it concise, but I don't know how that'll work out. <laughs> but wise and simple, she asks, we're not strangers to Disney. They her husband lived in Florida most of his life. What are your thoughts on the dining plan where we are, we are reassessing it at the moment? Well, guess what? We're reassessing it too. This year will be the first year that we are going without the dining plan in probably the last 10, 10 or 12 trips or so. Um, we you know, back in the day, there was no dining plan. You paid for your meals, and that was the way it was, and you spent what you spent, and you would sit there and, like, every meal think, oh, I can't get this because it's $40 for a bottle of water or whatever. Um, and then the dining plan came along, and it was, like, the best thing since sliced bread. But then you start to realize the more and more you go and use the dining plan, you start to realize that a lot of times you're eating way more than you want or than you would typically get just because it's included in the dining plan, and you don't want to waste your dining plan, so you're going to eat... 45 snacks in five days and you're not going to waste one because that would be wasteful because you've already paid for dining plan so you get sick because you've eaten 45 mickey sandwiches 914 orange smoothies and 14 mickey pretzels because that was included in your dining plan and you're sick to your stomach because you have to feel like you use every single penny of your dining plan there's a lot of good things about it but i started to wonder this year in particular um if it really is worth it for us. So this is the first year in about 10 or 12 years we are going to go to Disney and we are not going to have the dining plan. I actually had it on our reservation and I took it off. Taking it off saved $3,000, no joke, on a 10-day trip. And that's a lot of money. $3,000 is a lot of money. Without a doubt, it is expensive to eat at Disney, but I, I just can't imagine that we're eating $3,000 worth of food. So I kind of feel like this trip to Disney we're going without our pants on because we could be very sorry and wish that we had it. Um, but other than a few really expensive um, character meals we're planning and a trip to La Cellier, which is kind of pricey, um, we're doing Be Our Guest for lunch this year instead of dinner. Not because we don't want to pay the dinner price, but because I don't think the food is that great. I'm, people might think I'm crazy. We've been to Be Our Guest a couple times for dinner. and. I just, I mean, I am boring. I've said that before. I am boring and plain. I like things simple, but I just was not that much impressed with the food. It's more the experience of anything that makes Be Our Guest special. So we're going to go for lunch this time, which is a counter service. It's a little bit cheaper. The experience is going to be pretty much the same. You're in the same building, but it's just going to be at lunchtime. The prices are a little bit cheaper. The menu is a little bit different. Um, and then other than Chef Mickey's, which I think will be probably our most expensive meal because it is character dining, um, I think everything else is going to be fairly reasonable. I mean, of course it's expensive. It's more than we would spend to go out and eat here at home, probably, but um, 
to go to like, you know, Rainforest Cafe or somewhere. But I still don't think it's going to cost $3,000. I could be completely wrong. It could also maybe dampen the trip a little bit because you are going to be more conscious of paying per meal or per snack or per water bottle than you would if you had the dining plan that you had already paid for ahead of time. That is a worry off your mind. You don't have to sit there and think, well, I just spent $10 on a pretzel and a bottle of water. So it, you know, that's kind of an aspect to it too. But I do plan on doing a video when we get back talking about my experience of going without the dining plan versus having the dining plan. Do I think it's worth it? Do I not think it's worth it? And the pros and cons of that. So the short answer for you is we are reassessing it as well. And I kind of think it depends on um, if you want to have that mentality when you're down there. Do you want to be thinking each meal like I just spent hundred dollars at Chef Mickey's or I, you know, do you want to have that worry when you're down there? And then also, you know, call the Disney company and find out how much it would cost to have a dining plan and think about your family. Typically, do you think you're going to spend that much to pay for your own food while you're down there? I really am siding with the fact that I don't think we're going to spend $3,000 on food. Um, and then of course, making sure that when we plan our trip, that we, we know that that's an expense we're going to have once we're down there versus having the dining plan that's already paid for, we are going to have to make sure we have the cash or the extra money on our debit card or whatever to pay for the food once we're down there. That's something we've kind of gotten used to not having to do, but it is something we're going to have to do this year. But I will let you know in that follow-up video, it probably won't be up until the end of May or maybe June, um, but just be watching for that and just so you can kind of get my opinion on that. See, that was a long, that was a long explanation. That's already the first question. I'm, we're in trouble. Okay, Liz Edna Oh no, I can't pronounce your last name. Bon Caris. I'm not gonna. I am not gonna try to pronounce your last name because I am an idiot. But is your name Liz Edna? That's your first name, right? Her question was how much of an estimate. Uh, her her question was an estimate of how much a trip for two adults and two children would be on Disney. If it's better to stay inside Disney or outside, and what park is better for a three year old? Well, it says for a three and three years old. Um, so I don't know what the other age is, but it says three year old. Okay. It's really hard to give you an estimate of how much it would cost um, for two adults and two kids just because it does depend on are you getting park hoppers or are you not? Are you How long are you staying? Do you plan to use a dining plan or do you not? Do you plan on staying on Disney property or do you not? All I can tell you from my experience is I personally, you could probably very easily find a hotel cheaper off property than it would be to stay on Disney property. For me, Disney World is like a snow globe, and once I'm in the snow globe, I don't want to leave the snow globe. I don't go outside of the snow globe while we're on our vacation. That means I don't want to go out and outlet mall shop. I don't want to leave the property to go to a different hotel, which we did do growing up. There were years when we stayed at like a Hilton or a Hyatt in Kissimmee and then drive to Disney World every day. Um, I, so I've done both, but to me, and being, being on Disney property 24-7 and staying at a Disney hotel is part of the experience to me just as much as the parks are. The parks are fun and they're great, but to go back to the hotel or to check into the hotel that first day, to me, that is like going home to the mothership. I mean, that is my happy place and I like to be surrounded by that all the time. It's part of the experience. You do pay for it, it's a lot more to, to stay there. I mean, you can stay at the value resorts and save quite a bit of money. And depending on when you're going, you probably could get a deal on the value resort that would be pretty comparable to what an off-site hotel would be. So you might not be saving a whole lot to go off property unless you get just some really great deal at a hotel somewhere. There are also the benefits of staying on property because you do have access to the Disney bus lines. If you don't have a rental car, you can take the buses to all the parks and hotels or the water parks if you choose to. I don't because I, I don't like to do, that, to do that, but you could have that as an option. You also have the benefit of um, not having to pay to park at each theme park each day. If you stay off Disney property, you have to pay, I don't know if it's like 10 or $15 per day to park at the various theme parks. So that's a little bit of a savings right there. Over the course of a week, you're saving at least $70 on parking. So there are some really good aspects of staying on property. There's also the benefit of the extra magic hours that you get as a benefit of staying on Disney property. You have the days where each park is open either an hour or so early or late that you get to stay that only Disney Resort guests get to stay there at those times, get to go to the parks at those times. So you're able to ride more and spend more time in the parks of quality time versus waiting in line when the parks are busier. Um, so there's a lot of benefits of both financially and just fun wise. But for me, it's part of the experience. It's part of the magic of Disney and it's, it's willing, it's worth the price to me 
to stay on property. I would have a hard time going to Disney World and not staying on property at this point. Um, as far as the estimate of two adults and two kids, again, it depends on how long you're staying and if you're staying on Disney property or not. But if you're renting a car, if you're flying, all those things. My best recommendation to you and to anybody that is interested at all at going to Disney World will be to sign up for the mousesavers.com newsletter. It's a free newsletter they mail out the 15th of every month and if there is a coupon code or a special on Disney prices for tickets and hotels, that is where you will find out about those discounts. And typically, um, like if you're going to go to Disney in the spring, you usually will find out what the special is going to be back in late winter. So November, December, they will be advertising what special they're going to have in the spring, so around March, April, May. So that's always when we are making sure we're paying particular attention to that website and to that newsletter because we know we go in every spring. Um, so we want to make sure that we're taking advantage of any kind of a special that is available. So that's the first thing I would suggest to make sure you sign up for that so that whenever you're going, you're getting the best deal you can get. Sometimes in the fall, they offer the free dining plan, which I talked about in the last question. Um, a lot of times you get a discount on maybe um, your hotel or your hotel and sometimes they throw in an extra day of the park tickets for free. So it just kind of depends on when you're going. Um, so make sure you're signed up for that. Um, I will say that it's a lot more expensive now that my 12 year old is considered an adult because when we go she's she is charged the adult theme park ticket price. She's charged the adult dining plan. Um, when we went last year she was considered an adult and she was charged the adult rate of getting her dining plan versus the child rate. I think when they're 11, they start counting them as an adult, which is ridiculous. But it is the way it is. So um, that makes a difference too. Uh, it seems like your kids are probably under that age, so you're a little bit safe in that area. And usually it would be um, staying on Disney property, getting hoppers, and including the dining plan for us, it was around, it seems like three or $4,000 when um, with, with a special of some sort. Usually, I mean, I, I don't know, we haven't been under $3,000 probably since my old, since probably since I had one child who was considered a child was the last time a trip to Disney ever cost less than $3,000. Now that she's considered an adult, um, and we stay a long time, we usually stay I think nine nights, um, usually, and this year it's going to be nine nights as well. Um, it's usually, well, taking the dining plan off, it was um, I think $3,700 with no dining plan, no trip insurance. So that's just um, six day hoppers, which we're getting ready to add seven days. But right now for six day hoppers, no dining plan, staying on Disney property at a moderate resort um, for nine nights, I believe was $3,600, which if it was gonna have the dining plan on it, it was over $5,000. I don't know if that helps you at all in, in your frame of reference. It really is a hard question to answer. If you call the Disney number, there's no obligation. You can talk to them and kind of ask them hypothetically if I go on vacation in June and I have, you know, two adults and two kids that are under 11, how much would it cost to stay at the hotel? How much would it cost to not stay at the hotel? They will tell you every theoretical situation that you want to make and I've done that to them many times. That's what they're there for. They're really nice. So you can always call them to get a more accurate estimate based on kind of where you want to stay, how long you want to stay, if you plan on getting the dining plan or not and then what time of year you're going. So those things are really what's going to make or break the number I could give you and I really don't want to give you a, high, a number that's too high or a number that's too low. My main suggestion would be to sign up for the Mouse Savers newsletter and then call the Disney reservation number and talk to them and kind of give them more of an idea of what you're thinking and they can give you more of, a, of an accurate estimate. Bobby Joe Moody says, I have two questions. First, one, we are going in July to Disney with the kids. When should I make an appointment for the Bibbidi Bobbidi Boutique? The first answer to that question is as soon as possible. The reservations for that book up really quickly. There's two locations where you can do it. There's one at Downtown Disney, which is now called Disney Springs, and there's one at um, Cinderella Castle in Magic Kingdom. So um, you do have two places you can do it. If one is booked up, you could always go to the other one. I think it's more magical to do it at Cinderella's Castle in Magic Kingdom. That's where we've always done it. Um, and usually at, at Disney Springs, it's really busy and, and hectic where they do it in the Disney store. And so I would recommend doing it at Magic Kingdom. But the reservations do book up quickly. So as soon as you know whatever day, you see, you know you're going in July, but as soon as you know what day you're going to be spending at Magic Kingdom, um, if you don't have an idea kind of already picked out, then that's fine. You know, you could always plan your day around um, this reservation. Like if you can only get one day of your trip that is, has availability for Bibby Bobbity Boutique, then let that be the day you go to Magic Kingdom. A lot of times I plan our dining reservations around which days, which parks are open late. 
And so if we know that Magic Kingdom is open until midnight on Monday, then we usually will know that Monday we're going to go to Chef Mickey's for breakfast, then we're going to go over to Magic Kingdom, spend the day over there. And so that's when I would make any dining reservations for Magic Kingdom or also in your case, a reservation for Bibbidi Bobbidi Boutique. So basically the key to Disney is everything as soon as possible. As soon as you think you might want to do something, I would go ahead and make a reservation for it. It's better to have one now than to wait until the last minute and then not be able to get one. Um, also, I mentioned before, if it's something you're interested in to save a little bit of money, to bring your own dress to the Bibbidi Bobbidi Boutique and then all you're having to do is pay for the least expensive package, which is I think $60. And that includes hair, nails, makeup, and a sash, I think is what they got, for $60. And that's with no dress. So, you know, if you start adding dresses to it, it's easily going to be over $100. And, you know, if you have one already at home, if you want to buy one at the Disney store at your local mall, any of that stuff's going to be cheaper than buying it down there at Disney. If that doesn't, if that's not something you're worried about ruining part of the experience, even if your child doesn't see it. Even if you want to pick out a dress for her to wear before you go, it's still going to be a surprise to her. You know, you carry it in a garment bag. We did this several times. Um, we would pick out which dress she was going to wear or ask her, but there was times she didn't know. We'd take it in a garment bag, and then when you get to the Bibbidi Bobbidi Boutique, they find out, oh, I'm going to get my hair and nails done, and you're like, and here's your dress you get to wear. They don't care if it's Belle and they wanted Cinderella or if it's Rapunzel and they wanted Snow White. It seems new, it's exciting, and it's a special experience for them. So I would highly recommend bringing your own dress to the Bibbidi Bobbidi Boutique to save some money. She also asks, is there anything I can do with my two-year-old that he might like? Um, it kind of depends on what kind of two-year-old you have. If you're wanting an experience like that, they do have the Pirates League, which is also at Magic Kingdom. It's at the exit of the Pirates of the Caribbean ride, and they give them pirate makeup. So girls can get pirate makeup, boys can get pirate makeup, and then they also at that location have a mermaid makeover, which my girls did last year. And it's not like Little Mermaid, it's just a generic mermaid. But it's really pretty scaled eye makeup that they do, and they do their hair a little bit, and they get a special clip and a sash and a necklace. So that's fun. But they do pirate makeup there for boys if your little, if your two-year-old would like that. Again, you could kind of bring in, if you wanted to bring in maybe a sword or things like that, if he watches Jake and the Neverland Pirates, a costume for that maybe to go with it. But this is the first trip to Disney for all three kids, and we want to make it special. So any other fun ideas would be great. Um, if your kids are into horseback riding, they do have horseback riding at Fort Wilderness. Um, they have pony rides for the smaller kids and then big horses for the bigger kids. I don't know how old your other kids are. I think you have to be... I think it's I think you have to be seven or nine to be um, old enough to ride the big horses. So last year, my oldest daughter and I rode the big horses, and my littlest daughter rode the ponies. And the pony rides were really inexpensive. I think it was five dollars, and you as the parent actually get to lead the pony around this path. And so it was really neat, a really neat experience. That's fun. Um, of course, they have mini golf on property. That's fun too. So I think if you just spend a little time exploring the Disney World website, and there's actually a special section for preschoolers. Um, you can look at some of the things that are going to be more fun for those kids that maybe aren't as big to ride the bigger rides um, but still want to be part of the experience and still want to have special fun. Um, there are some really great options for that too. And we've gone with kids, you know, starting at two years old, and there's a lot of stuff that they can do. Um, also, to keep in mind, if you, um, you know, you, I don't know how old your kids are. You mentioned having a two year old, so obviously he's not going to be old enough to ride a lot of the rides that maybe some of the older kids are going to want to ride. Disney has something called a ride swap where you wait in line and then you tell them when you get up to the front that you want to do a ride swap. And that way you wait in line once, but each parent can ride with the kids. So like your husband would go with the, with the older kids and ride whatever the, the youngest kids can't ride while you wait with the youngest. And then you switch and you get to ride it with the oldest kids while your husband waits with the youngest. That's a really nice way to work it out so that you're not splitting up the whole family the entire trip. Heather Shea says, hi from Prince Edward Island, Canada. Anne of Green Gables land. I love Anne of Green Gables. Myself, my husband, and three children along with my parents and my sister and family are headed to Florida in 30 days. We have purchased a one-day pass to Magic Kingdom along with a few other places, but are wondering what you would suggest for a dining experience at Disney. What is the best value, experience, and food for your dollar? Thanks for any suggestions. Well, honestly, value of food for your dollar is not going to happen a whole lot in Disney. Um, what we usually do though, a little bit to save money, and we did this even when we were on the dining plan, is to have a late breakfast um, and then kind of skip, I wouldn't say skip lunch, but have a really early dinner. That helps you for several reasons. It helps you to offset a little bit of the cost of having three full meals at Disney parks, but also it helps you to avoid a lot of the dinner crowd. If you wait till five, six, seven, eight o'clock to have dinner, then everybody else is having dinner at those times too. So we usually have breakfast between 10 and 11 
And if we need lunch, we'll either bring a snack with us from the hotel or we'll get a small snack at the park, like a pretzel or something, and then have lunch, which is really kind of like dinner, at 3 o'clock. A lot of the restaurants, I think, stop serving lunch at 3 o'clock anyway, and they switch over to, to their dinner menu at 4, if I'm thinking of it right. So we usually have our dinner at 3. So we avoid a lot of that crowd. It's easier to get our um, reservations that way, and it saves a little bit of money that way because you're really only having two full meals probably at the parks versus three. Um, and then for dinner, we'll usually have a snack or a small counter service or something like that where it's a little bit cheaper. So we do that anyway. We've always done that even on the dining plan to stretch our dining plan. Um, and now that we're going without the dining plan, it's going to be really helpful to be able to manage of not having the three full meals at the parks. As far as my recommendations, places to dine at Disney, like I said, I'm pretty boring. Uh, I like a lot of the same things. I'm very repetitive and I like a lot of simple things. But I will say, at Magic Kingdom, we've eaten at Tony's before. It's not my favorite, but if you like a sit-down Italian meal, they do have that, and they have breakfast there as well. Um, I, it's not my favorite, but a lot of people really like it. I like um, Liberty Tree is my favorite at Disney at uh, Magic Kingdom. It's a sit-down restaurant uh, right across from the Hall of Presidents, and um, you make a reservation for it. I would recommend re making a reservation for a lunch there because at dinner time they serve what they call family style. So they bring out just big bowls and you kind of dip out what you want. I like ordering from a menu and so I don't like that. So we always go at lunch time for there and they have really good turkey and dressing. Um, for whatever reason Magic Kingdom has really gross water and their soft drinks also kind of reflect that taste. I don't really know if it's a different water situation at Magic Kingdom versus the other parks because I, I it's, it's just weird. Their water tastes odd to me. So. Me personally, I would recommend bringing extra bottled water on the day you're at Magic Kingdom in case you find that same thing where you don't like any of their soft drinks uh, or tea because the water tastes weird. Other than that, I love Liberty Tree. It's really good. Chef Mickey's is my favorite restaurant, which is funny to say because I hate buffets. If you try to make me go to a buffet here in town, I will claw and scratch my way in doorknobs and facings holding on so you cannot make me go to a buffet. I hate it. I hate picking over people's food. I hate the the, I, I don't like the sneeze guards, I don't like the plates, they're always dirty, I don't like the forks, it's uncomfortable, you're trying to hold your plate, you're trying to fill your kid's plate, and there's nowhere to lay them. I don't like buffets, they're gross. But Chef Mickey's is the best buffet ever, and we only go at breakfast, they do have lunch, and they might have dinner now too, but we always go for breakfast, whatever day we're going to Magic Kingdom, at least once, we know we're going to go to Chef Mickey's that morning. But I love Chef Mickey's, they have the best Mickey waffles, and the best butter, I mean, it's the, oh my goodness, the butter is so good. So I love that. Um, let's see, at Hollywood Studios, uh, Brown Derby, the Brown, Hollywood Brown Derby is really good. It's kind of pricey, but it's really good. Um, if you're wanting something a little cheaper, the Pizza Planet is over there in the Toy Story kind of area, and it's just a quick service kind of a pizza, pizza and salad kind of a thing. It's not the best pizza in the world, but if your kids or your family anybody likes Toy Story, it's kind of fun to eat there because Pizza Planet was in the Toy Story movies. Um, at Epcot, goodness, I'm really picky and I don't like anywhere at Epcot. I know people are going to think I'm crazy because a lot of people love to eat the food in the countries. Um, the only place I like to eat at Epcot is Le Cellier, which is the Canadian steakhouse. Again, it's kind of pricey, but I usually get off the kids menu, not because of the price, but just because that's what I do here at home a lot too, is the kids menu. So they have really good steak, they have really good rolls, they have really good chicken really good french fries so I like Le Cellier. It's a hard one to get so you want to make sure that you get an advanced reservation. Oh also at Hollywood Studios is Starring Rolls. It's a little cafe where they don't have any inside seats. They all have like little um, patio chairs and tables. But they have really good pastries and little quick delicatessen type sandwiches so that one's a really good one. Um, at Animal Kingdom my favorite is Rainforest Cafe and there's also a location at Disney Springs. Um, but Rainforest Cafe is my favorite and um, Pizza Fari, which again is the same type of pizza they have at Pizza Planet. It's a little bit better usually, um, but the, the, the room that you eat in is really neat and we always eat at Pizza Fari for lunch and then eat at Rainforest Cafe on the way out of Animal Kingdom that day. We also eat at Rainforest Cafe the first day that we're at Disney and that is again at Disney Springs. Um, so it, it feels so weird to say Disney Springs. It's always been downtown Disney, but I'm going to have to make myself say it. Um, but that's a really good one, really good hamburgers, and they have chicken, they used to have salmon, they have really good french fries, so it's a really good place. I would highly, highly recommend Rainforest Cafe for everybody in the family. The kids like it, the adults are going to like it, it's great. But I would make sure that if you have not made any dining reservations, um, you really should go ahead and call and do that. I think it's 1407-WDW-DINE, um, and you should be able to make some reservations. Hopefully there's some things still available. Ashley Miller said, 
I have shared the same love for Disney. My husband, husband and I are going to Disney Epcot for the day for the day of October 1st. Just the two of us without kids. It will be during their annual food and wine festival. We were planning on eating at the indoor Mexican restaurant for dinner. Is there anything special we should explore that isn't obvious within the countries? Any other tips would be great. I found your channel a couple of days ago and I love your videos. Thank you. Well, thank you, Ashley. Um, I kind of mentioned already that Epcot's not my favorite place because I'm not an exotic eater. I don't like a lot of unique foods. Um, but I guess I would still recommend La Cellier, which is the Canadian steakhouse. As far as um, neat things to do in the country without kids, I know they have a lot of things for kids. Um, just make sure that you take time to look around. If you like to go to the countries, make sure you take time to go to the shops and the little the little um, cafes that they have. Like in France, they have a little place a place in the back that maybe you wouldn't have seen if you're with kids and you're trying to rush through that area. They have a little place with pastries, um, little French um, souvenirs and things you can pick up in the shop. And just, I really think at Epcot, a lot of it for me is taking the time to enjoy the scenery. We always go when it's the part of the um, Flower and Garden Festival. We've gone when it wasn't, but most of the time we go, it is the, the Flower and Garden Festival. So sometimes you get so busy with dining reservations and going here and going there and riding this and riding that, but Epcot's really one where there's not a whole lot to ride. So it's all about the experience of being in the park, enjoying the landscaping, walking through the countries, and really taking the time when you go to the stores and when you go to the countries, a lot of the places have people from that country doing a show or an exhibit of some kind. We were going through, I think it was Morocco one year, and he was hand carving these really neat intricate canes. And my girls were mesmerized to see how quickly and how he just so professionally and perfectly would cut these amazing animal shapes out of wood and with just wood and a knife. And they were really amused by that. And the, the guy let my oldest daughter kind of chip away at a little piece of that of the cane he was making. And those little things really make part of the experience of Disney what it is. And a lot of times with kids, it's easy to overlook it because you do have such an agenda and you're trying to hurry up and get stuff done before your fast passes up or before the kids have a meltdown. So now that you're going alone, you can really take the time to enjoy those little moments. And they're usually on the map they'll have whenever each country is going to have a certain show or exhibition out in the front of each country. So maybe making a note that you want to pay a little bit of extra attention to those things and just making that part of your experience. And of course, I know with the Food and Wine Festival, there are so many restaurants and little pop-up restaurants that you can try all different types of food that you would never have um, the ability to try out any other time of the year. So I would say just to make sure that you don't make too many plans, too many, too many reservations. Um, you know, I mean, I recommend La Cellier, and I know you're going to the Mexican restaurant, but making sure you're taking time to look through the countries because it is easy to overlook things. Like even in um, Mexico, there's a ride right next to the Mexican restaurant that I think last year we went and we walked right on. And it's a little boat ride, and it's silly, and it's goofy, and it's for kids, but it's cute, it's cozy, it's romantic, and it's one of those things that, it's just part of the experience that you might have overlooked if you were rushing around with kids that you can take the time to enjoy now that you're going by yourself. So I hope you have a great trip. Robin L says, we want to be there when the doors open so we can take advantage of the first two hours of the parks are open. What time do we need to be there to do this? I'm not asking what time the parks open. I mean, if the park opens at nine, when do I need to be in the parking lot by? Well, I mean, I think Disney recommends an hour for any park to get there ahead of time. Now, obviously, if you're going to Magic Kingdom, that matters a lot more because it takes a lot longer to get to Magic Kingdom because once you're in the Magic Kingdom parking lot, you're still a mile and a half away from the actual park. You have to either take a boat ferry ride over or a monorail over from the Mar Magic Kingdom parking lot to the Magic Kingdom theme park. So that in itself takes a while, especially if you're going at a peak time when they're getting ready to open. A lot of people are gonna be doing the same thing. And so the boats fill up quickly and sometimes you have to wait for a boat, sometimes you have to wait for a monorail. So always plan at least an hour ahead of time, especially if you're going to Magic Kingdom. A lot of the other parks are a little bit easier, especially if you're traveling from a Disney resort to a Disney theme park and you're already on property. It's a lot quicker than if you were outside the Disney parks. Um, and again, if you're staying on Disney property um, and not having to pay to park, that saves you time because you're gonna have a parking pass in your windshield and when you drive through the entrance of each theme park's parking lot, the person, you know, the attendant working at the little booth will see your parking pass and just kind of wave you on through versus having to stop and pay every time you go to a theme park each day. So that saves you a little bit of time. But I would still say as a general rule, at least an hour, especially if it's Magic Kingdom, maybe even a little bit more than that. Um, I know the blogs do say to get there as soon as they open, and I know there's benefit to that, but if you're staying on Disney property and you have the option of using the extra magic hours before or after the park opens, 
that to me really lessens the, the, the pressure of feeling like you have to get there as soon as the rope drops when they open. Um, so if you're staying on Disney property, you know, maybe plan on whatever night you're at Magic Kingdom that you're going to stay till midnight and you're going to maybe not go as early in the morning. We do that with our kids. Like a lot of people have asked me, do you take your kids back to the hotel for naps in the middle of the day or do you just go, go, go? We've done both. And a lot of times we found by the time we get back to the resort, get everybody washed up, use the bathroom, change into their something like sleeping clothes, get them in the bed, talk them into going to sleep, go to sleep, go back to sleep. By the time you do all that, they fall asleep, then you get them up, then you put them back in their clothes, take them to the bathroom, get in the car, go to the park. You spent a big part of your day and a lot of times it just made them crankier. They just slept long enough to make them cranky and then you wake them up and you stick them back in the park. And that's my kids. I mean, your kids might be different. So what we usually do, unless we have an early dining reservation in the morning, which I try not to ever do, no earlier than nine for sure, um, we let them sleep pretty much as long as they want. They typically will wake up on their own. I will go ahead and get up around, you know, whenever I wake up. I usually for some reason wake up around eight o'clock without an alarm every morning. Um, so I'll get up and kind of get myself ready. That way when the kids start waking up, I'm able to help get them ready and, um, well, my oldest daughter gets herself ready, but I can get the youngest ready, brush hair, give, give some little drinks of milk and maybe a snack and get sunscreen on while my husband showers and then we're ready to go. And that way nobody has been woken up from their deep sleep to get up early to go to the park just to be cranky. And then we'll stay pretty much until the park closes or until we're ready to leave. Um, that's how we have kind of progressed with it over the years. So it's up to you. Make your own decision. If you want to get there at rope drop though, I would suggest leaving at least an hour before the park opens to make sure you have time to get there. Maybe an hour and a half if it's Magic Kingdom. Um, and then otherwise, maybe try what I suggested. If you're staying on Disney property, try it both ways. Maybe try going to Magic Kingdom when they open one day. And the next time, go and take advantage of the extra magic hours at night and just get to Magic Kingdom in the daytime whenever you have eaten breakfast and you get there and then whatever time you get there you get there um so try it both ways and really see how it works for you and your family but i really i wouldn't i wouldn't stress yourself out too much at getting there exactly at rope drop because i don't know that it makes too terribly much of a difference that's my personal opinion she also says i've watched a lot of what's in my disney park purse videos i don't want to take a tote bag in just exactly what i need and no more but i'm worried that i will forget something I know you can buy in the parks, but everything is so expensive. Do I really need to bring an umbrella? Well, we've never brought an umbrella. We bring ponchos. There have been years we've forgotten, and um, we bought them at the parks, and they were like $20 a piece. So that was a mistake that we have not made since. Um, I mentioned in my videos last year, and I'm not sure. I, I guess it was in our What's to Park in our theme park bag video. Um, I don't know if you've seen mine or not, but I do mention ponchos. We bring five, one for each of us and one for the stroller. Now, if you have a stroller and you probably have a fancy maybe rain canopy of some sort, we never bought one and our stroller didn't come with one, so we would always just pull the little half canopy over and then kind of drape the, the stroller over with a poncho. One thing that's annoying is if, you, if it's raining and you try to park your stroller in a non-designated stroller parking area, the employees will move your stroller out in the rain and put it in the stroller parking area and it will get wet. So we always buy a poncho specifically for the stroller. And since they're cheap at the dollar store, we throw them away. Um, you know, and then jackets with hoods. Usually when we go, it's not just a huge downpour where if we put a hood up, we wouldn't be okay just kind of walking around in some sprinkles. The good thing about Florida is it does tend to rain in the afternoon, but it usually goes away pretty quickly and then it dries up really quickly. You could always bring an umbrella, maybe just one of those little pop-up ones. I mean, that's up to you. A small one's not going to make a whole lot of extra room in your bag. And if it gives you peace of mind to have it, that would be something you could definitely bring. But I don't usually bring an umbrella and a lot of times they're harder to handle and hold and push a stroller and whatever than it would be just to have a poncho or a jacket with a hood and roll on with it. I'll link my Disney playlist down below and you can watch what we put in our daily park bag if you're interested to see what we take. Sarah Stafford says, what would your ideal Disney World trip look like? Where would you eat and when? What would you ride and when? Also, character breakfast, some of the sites tell you to arrive at the park 45 minutes early for rope drop, but what if you have breakfast? Would you advise doing a later breakfast brunch and maximize that first or two, hour or two in the park? Well, some of that kind of goes back to what I already answered about being there at rope drop. I mean, obviously, if you have a dining reservation at a park right when the park opens, then yeah, you're going to have to be there and you're going to want to leave your hotel if you're staying on Disney property probably around an hour before your reservation, um, if not more. I mean... 
it kind of depends on if again if it's Magic Kingdom or not. Um, but I really try as a rule again to always make sure that our earliest dining reservation is not terribly early because I know that it takes us a while to get ready and it takes us a while to get off you know off out of our hotel and to the park and out of the car and in the tram and in the tram to the turnstiles and you know it takes a little while. So yeah, you could definitely do what you just said to have a later breakfast or a brunch and utilize that first hour or two in the park or try out what I said about um, you know, not making a reservation that's too early, letting your kids kind of wake up naturally and not making them get up maybe too early. If they've been out the night before and then you wake them up to get up for an early morning breakfast reservation and they're going to be cranky and nobody's going to have a good time. I'm big about not waking people up too early, uh, especially kids on vacation. The last thing you want to do on vacation is to shake the cage of a sleeping dragon. You want to let them sleep and then have a later breakfast or a brunch like you said. Um, as far as my ideal Disney trip, Pretty much any trip to Disney is ideal, but I would at some point like to stay at the Animal Kingdom Lodge. I think it'd be hard for me though because we always stay at Riverside and to me that's home. So even though I want to stay at the Animal Kingdom Lodge, I would still miss going to Riverside. So I don't know. I would like the experience of being able to look out my balcony and see giraffes because I love giraffes. But I don't know that I want to give up the, the low, like slow pace of Riverside. It's so comfortable to me. It really does feel like home away from home. And I'm comfortable there. Um, obviously, I would like to be able to stay, uh, you know, longer because you know, you, no matter how long you stay down there, it's never enough time, and you always feel to some extent a little bit rushed because you've got to feel like you get your money wor money's worth out of the parks, and you've got to eat all the places you want to eat, and you've got to make sure you go to all your fast passes, and you've got to make sure you use all, go to your, all your dining reservations. But it would be nice to be able to stay down there longer and just be able to spend more time at the hotels and walk around. And if you stay on Disney property, you're welcome to go to any of the other Disney resorts to walk around, to eat, to look, to shop, whatever you want to do. So to be able to do that would be more fun, would be fun as well. As far as what I would ride and when, it would be really awesome to be able to ride um, the Snow White ride as many times as I want. That's one of my favorites. Rock and Roller Coaster and what's the other one? I don't know. I'm really boring, but I like the Living with the Land Boat Ride in the Land at Epcot, which was funny when I was a kid. I hated that ride, but I love it. It's so calming and relaxing. So really, I think, I guess it's stupid to say that my ideal Disney trip is already the one that I take because I stay where I want to stay for the most part. We're lucky enough to stay longer than a lot of people get the chance to stay. Um, we always eat at our favorite places and... Um, other than just staying even longer, I think really I'm pretty happy with the way things are. And maybe being able to go more often. Um, even at once a year, it's not enough. Uh, there have been a couple years we've gone twice a year, but um, it, once a year is not enough. I love that place. And knowing that I'm going to go makes me so happy and excited. I'm like a little kid. Uh, the last question is from ALQ26. Um, they ask, we were wondering if it's worth it to do the dining package. Um, again, back to the first question of it kind of depends on you and what you like to eat. Do you eat a lot of food when you're on vacation? Do you like to eat a lot of the expensive places? Um, or would you be just happy to pay out of pocket and, you know, pay maybe for the expensive places and maybe not eat for someplace expensive for lunch or dinner. So it's kind of personal preference as far as do I think it's worth it? Again, I don't really know. We're going to go again. We're going to go this year and not have it. And so again, I'll say to you to watch that video when we get back and, and I'll kind of give you an idea of what I thought about it and did I really feel like it's worth it. It is a great, I mean, it's a great convenience and it's great to be able to pay for your trip, your entire trip, including your food. I know that's taken care of before you leave the house. So you don't have to think again about money. Unless you want to buy something over and above that's not covered on your dining plan, you don't have to worry about what you're spending or how many snacks you get or if you get four Mickey pretzels in one day because you've used your snacks for that. I mean, it's nice to be able to have that worry off your mind. But financially, it is a big part of your trip. And it just really all boils down to the fact of, do you think you're going to eat that much money's worth of food if you're paying out of pocket? For us, I don't know. I'm, st I'm really starting to wonder. So I'll find out and I will let you know in that video at the end of May or maybe June. Oh, and she also, they also asked, what is the candlelight processional? That is something they do at Epcot at Christmas time. It's an outdoor stage show that they do. They have music and candlelights. Candlelight, they usually also have a special celebrity guest speaker slash singer musician that will come and uh, sometimes it's an actor that will come and do some um, like dramatic reading or songs or something like that so it's something that you 
um, have to make a reservation for. And there are there at specific times uh, during your trip. You'd have to check the website to see when you're going, when the available times are for your trip, and which celebrity is going to be there. Maybe there's certain a certain celebrity that you want to see on a certain day. So those are all things that you can find on the Disney World website. And then also there are some restaurants that participate in um, reserved seating for the candlelight processional. So I think that there's one of the Italian restaurants that does it. And so basically what you do is you book your dining reservation at certain select Epcot um, restaurants with the candlelight processional option. And so what that does is once you pay for your dinner, they usually give you a ticket or a pass that you will take at your designated time to the candlelight processional and they'll have reserved seating for you in a certain spot so that you don't have to get there as early to get a good seat to be able to see the stage and the lights and all that stuff. So all that information is on the on the Disney World website in the Epcot section. Once you find the candlelight processional you should be able to find the dining option where you get the reserved seating. If not you can also call the Disney Dining Reservation number which is the 1407 WDW Dine um, and they can also tell you what days and times are available and which celebrities are going to be there at any given day of your trip. So I hope that's helpful. I hope that I was able to answer all these questions for you guys without it being 9 million years long. Probably not. My kids have been knocking on the door. Are you still making a video? But yes, I'm talking about Disney. I can make a video all day long. So I hope these uh, questions and answers were helpful for you, for you guys. Thank you so much for watching this video. Please like it. If you do, make sure you check out the Disney uh, playlist I have linked down below. It's got all my Disney videos on it from last year and also the Disney videos that I did for the Moms with Mouse Ears channel. Uh, make sure you subscribe so you don't miss any of my videos and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.